Fist of the North Star is a fight manga written by Yoshiyuki Okamura, pen name Moronsen, and illustrated by Tetsuo Hara. It was published from 1983 to 1988 in Shonen Jump, and stars a man named Kenshiro, an inheritor of the assassination martial art known as Hokuto Shinken, living in a Mad Max-style post-apocalyptic hellscape full of roving gangs. The plot of Fist of the North Star is less important for our purposes than the style of the fights and characters. The fighters are muscular, heavily so, and their movements are constructed to communicate the power behind their strikes. The violence is brutal, with people often torn to shreds. The action, gore, and character design of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure has, thus far, been heavily influenced by Fist of the North Star. And if you want to get an idea of the extent of this influence, I recommend Hamon Beat's video, Comics and Animation References in JoJo. But another place where we can see the influence is in the powers involved. Kenshiro's fighting style involves hitting opponents in secret pressure points, which causes them to violently die seconds after they have been struck, gifting us with the enduring meme. The gory outcome of the attack is meant to impress Kenshiro's strength and power on the audience. His calm demeanor and the delayed response to the attack communicates a sense of control. I mean, it's not subtle, the reason it's such an enduring meme is because it's so unsubtle and over the top. It hits the mark too precisely. It's no surprise then, that when Araki was designing Hamon, the ability used by the protagonist of the first two parts of Jojo, he took obvious inspiration from Fist of the North Star's Hokutu Shinken. The power, control, and spectacle were all ideal fits for the burgeoning style of Jojo. But I'm getting ahead of myself. An issue in introducing people to Jojo is the lack of stands in parts 1 and 2, paired with their overwhelming prevalence in later parts. Stands feel like such a central part of Jojo's bizarre adventure as it goes on, a way to encapsulate a character's uniqueness using a power set and a really elaborate character design, that the first two parts are often talked about as almost a prologue to part 3. Because how could it be Jojo without stands? But Araki himself has pointed out that the artistic purpose of Hamon and vampirism were much the same as stands to reveal to the audience something invisible. In this case, the struggle between Jonathan and Dio's chosen paths. Today, I'll go over these two abilities. We will be covering spoilers up through the end of part 1, which corresponds to episode 9 of the anime and chapter 44 of the manga, which is part way through volume 5. I believe the fundamental role of art is to make the invisible visible. Whatever the artist wants to express, be it love, friendship, justice, or something else, these are not things that can be seen by the eye, and the artist must turn these invisible ideas into a visible picture. Hirohiko Araki, Manga in Theory and Practice, The Craft of Creating Manga. Vampirism, as we have seen, comes from the stone mask. We'll leave the origins of the mask until battle tendency. But manga readers will recall that it was used by the Aztecs during the 12th to 16th centuries, and it was later purchased by Mary Joestar as an antique, which is how it came to be in the Joestar household. When exposed to blood, the stone mask activates, causing several spikes to protrude backwards from it. If someone is wearing the mask, these spikes will penetrate their skull and pierce the brain. Although this should logically kill the subject, it instead unlocks the brain's hidden potential, turning them into a vampire. So, what does being a vampire entail in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Well, for starters, a vampire can drain a person of blood, healing injuries, and blood can even make the vampire young again, extending their life. This allows a vampire to heal even from being badly burned or cut nearly in half, and that's before we get to part two. Vampires have overwhelming speed and strength, being able to destroy a stone wall and tear apart a person with ease. They also have a stranger ability, body control, and this one deserves a bit more of an explanation. A vampire can control their biology to a great degree, manipulating even individual veins, for example. Dio is the only full vampire we see in part 1, and something we see him do is evaporate the moisture in his arm in an instant, creating a flash freeze effect on whatever he touches. If you don't follow the logic of that, the rationale is this. When you're boiling water, or any substance really, you need heat energy to turn the liquid into gas. 
You need some heat to get it up to boiling temperature in the first place, but also a certain amount of heat to turn the boiling temperature liquid water into boiling temperature water vapor. It's like an extra energy tax for going from liquid to vapor at the same temperature. This amount of heat is called the heat of vaporization of a substance, and for water, this is pretty high. This is why sweating works. Heat from your skin goes into turning the water and the sweat into vapor, which leaves your skin cooler as the evaporating sweat takes the heat energy with it. Dio's vampire trick is essentially a super-powered version of the sweat cooling effect. Of course, that would imply he should be expelling hot steam from somewhere, and also the freezing effect is ridiculously effective for the amount of water. Not to mention 30 other absurdities, I'm sure, but hey, this is Jojo, and that's the logic, as it were. He's a vampire, what do you want from me? The final vampire ability we see displayed is the ability to create vampire zombies, a lesser form of vampire, which is done by killing someone through draining their blood. These zombies thirst for blood, they are physically strong like vampires, and they can make other zombies by draining people. However, they are limited in that they can't heal from damage like full vampires can, and they don't have the extreme body control abilities that Dio displays, though they certainly can have some strangeness to their bodies. It also seems that zombies are subservient to the vampire that created them, but that last point is a little hard to judge given Dio has had a strange charm from the beginning. It's worth noting that, when creating zombies, Dio seems to be able to meld different organisms together, as seen in this horrible dog-vampire thing, as well as the dreaded duty. Anyway, other than that chimera stuff and some of the weirder ways that body manipulation is used, the vampires in Phantom Blood are much more standard than you might expect from this series, where something as benign as cooking can become something strange and terrifying. Even the zombies fit into the wider trope of the vampire's thrall, a common staple of vampire fiction. And, of course, like any classic vampire, all these wondrous powers come at the cost of instant death upon being exposed to sunlight. They, uh, do not skimp on that one. So, as the least typical vampire power, I see body control as the ability that most reflects Dio's brand of evil. The general traits of a vampire, stealing other people's lives for power and life, are of course a good match for any character motivated by or wrestling with extreme selfishness. But it's body control that most emphasizes Dio's deep-seated need for, well, control. Whether killing Danny or placing the unnamed mother character in an impossible dilemma that actually has no solution, Dio has shown that his greatest desire is for power over people. Becoming a vampire grants Dio previously unimaginable degrees of physical control, both over himself and others. As a child, Dio didn't want to just hurt Jonathan. He wanted to corrupt the very sources of his happiness, to poison the well, so to speak. It was only later, when he realized that Jonathan wasn't a pushover, that he turned to murder. And even there, he sought to kill Jonathan using Jojo's own fascination with the mask. Control was what he was after as a human, and through the stone mask, this nature is revealed to us in graphic detail. There's actually at least one more vampire trait that crops up in part 2, but I want this to be mostly contained to part 1 for now. We'll get there later. Now let's take a look at the opposite power. Hamon, or the Ripper. Hamon enters the story due to a quirk of the stone mask's history. You see, the mask was unearthed in Mexico by an archaeological expedition. The disaster struck that expedition's ship as they returned to Europe. The expedition's leader somehow activated the mask, and upon becoming a vampire, he began to slaughter the rest of the crew. Before the leader could kill the last member of the expedition, however, the sun rose, killing the newly transformed vampire. The expedition's last survivor was the leader's own son, a young man named Will Antonio Zappelli. After those events, Zappelli searched the world for a power that could act as the sunlight an opposite to the mask's deadly power. In his quest, Sapelli met a young man who had the ability to heal other people's injuries by using a special breathing technique that endows one's blood with the life-giving energy of the sun. After that meeting, Zapelli journeys to Tibet, where he can learn to use that power, which he believes can counter vampirism. Indeed, since Hamon mimics the sun, it melts through a vampire's body, having an effect on them very similar to Fist of the North Star's Hokutu Shinken. The relationship between vampirism and Halmon is more than just antagonistic. As Zapelli himself points out, they are like two sides of the same coin. Just like Jonathan and Dio, while their purposes may be opposite, there is also a profound similarity between the two. Vampires heal by consuming blood, 
and one of the very first things we see Haman do is heal Jonathan. Zabeli's initial attack on Jonathan when they first meet is actually meant to change Jonathan's breathing, allowing him to generate Haman. That resulting Haman heals Jonathan, and there's even enough left over to cause a tree to sprout flowers. Of course, this healing is limited, as it can't heal someone from extreme wounds. And while we do later learn that Haman extends you, the user's lifespan is still fairly normal. It is only by exploding the life force of another that the vampire's extreme regeneration may be achieved. Something that is no problem for Dio's egomaniac brand of evil, but is antithetical to the heroic John. As far as Haman adding physical prowess to users, I'd say that's a little less clear. A lot of Haman training would naturally make someone more fit, and Jonathan pulls off some pretty ridiculous stunts before he ever trains in Haman. We're already dealing with pretty fantastical benchmarks, even for regular people in JoJo. I think it's fair, though, to say that if Haman does make you stronger or faster, it doesn't do it to nearly the same degree as vampirism. Except, of course, against vampires, which are heavily weak. This continues the theme of Haman being more limited than vampirism in ways consistent with the attitudes of our protagonist and villain. Vampirism is unrestrained in its ability for violence, but Haman is directed and purposeful. This directedness in Haman is expressed in its ability for fine control, a parallel of empiric body control. We see characters using Haman to precisely control the effects of their strikes in multiple occasions, beginning with Zapali harmlessly punching a frog, only breaking the stone beneath it to show off the concept. The force of a strike can be directed and even displaced a long distance via Haman. We also see the quick healing from Haman used to take advantage of dislocating one's own joints, a technique called Zoom Punch. Zoom punch. This is a very vampire-like application of self-healing that harkens to body control. Haman can also manipulate various materials, having better control over water and biological matter than things like stone and steel, which can only momentarily hold the charge of Haman. This culminates in Jonathan controlling a vampire's body at the end of the part. Like other abilities, Haman is clearly more limited than vampirism in this regard. It doesn't reshape objects to the same degree that vampirism can reshape a living thing, and even its capacity for range is later outstripped by body control applied as eye lasers, or, excuse me, pressurized vitreous fluid, which the manga calls Space Ripper Stingy Eyes. It's great. Given that Haman represents the power of the sun and light, and that the substances that best work with Haman are themselves organic or important to life, it seems that Haman works through natural channels of some kind, being able to inhabit things that can hold life. Huh, I wonder if distilled water would be worse for Haman use. Anyways, Haman flows along the existing natural order, whereas vampirism reshapes the natural into unnatural monstrosity. Finally, there is even an equivalent of the vampire's ability to create zombie underlings, though in this case the parallel is a little looser. Humans don't infect others with Haman, obviously, and they don't create underlings, but their ability to train others in the art can be thought of as an equivalent. We even see uses of Haman that make this more concrete, such as Zapelli's aforementioned jab, which begins Jonathan's training, and later when Zapelli uses the deep pass overdrive to pass his power onto Jonathan. This is a magical equivalent of Jonathan's more general status as Zapelli's successor in his quest. The contrasts between the powers are also important here. Vampirism spreads forcefully in a way that subjugates the new members, meanwhile Haman is taught and the students may well replace the master in time. In short, the very similarities between the two powers are because they both represent the determination and skill of their users and their ability to change and direct the world around them. The differences are due to their opposed goals and motivations. How long does it take Jonathan to learn this mystical art from Baron Zapelli? About a week, which we skip. Jonathan is a quick study, I guess. You know when I said there are two power systems in Phantom Blood? I lied. Kind of. There is a third-ish magic system we should talk about in this part. Fate. How a story deals with destiny speaks volumes about the attitudes and goals of the story. Often, in popular fiction, fate simply seems to be an agent of cosmic justice. Yes, sometimes fate deals a bad hand in those stories, but that's usually a preamble of sorts to a greater justice to be served later, a necessary evil. In this manner, fate becomes a benevolent god of sorts, an agent whose immediate actions are incomprehensible and scrutable, but who will eventually tie everything up with a neat bow and create a happy ending for everybody. Fate in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is not treated quite like this. 
more often fate is an obstacle to be overcome, a barrier which must be surpassed in order for good to thrive. All of this will be heavily expanded in future parts, but it starts here. The most explicit way we see fate interacted with in the part is through Hamon master Tan Petty. We learn that Zavelli's training in Tibet involved having his fate read through a handshake. This seems to be an ability related to Hamon mastery, though we don't actually see anyone other than Tom Petty ever use it in quite the same way. Kind of. I'll talk about this more once I get to start as Crusaders and I can discuss Hermit Purple. What's important to note now is that this tells us about how fate works in this world. After reading his fate, Tom Petty gives Zapelli a choice. If he decides to pursue Hamon training, it will lead to his untimely death. Zapelli accepts this, believing his purpose in stopping the stone mask to be more important than preserving his own life. This tells us two things. First, fate is not completely fixed. People's actions can clearly influence it. Decisions matter. But at the same time, the consequences are absolute. Zapelli could, in theory, choose not to pursue the mask, and thus avoid his potential destiny. But he can't have his cake and eat it too. He can't both fulfill his quest and survive the ordeal. Fate puts harsh limiters on what it is possible to do, and people must choose within those limits. That leads us to our second main takeaway. Although people's actions do affect their fate, these consequences do not act in a purely moral framework. Zabelli's righteous quest to rid the world of the stone mask is destined to end in death, while the villainous Dio is fated for luck and for long life according to mystical interpretation of his features. Fate is not always an ally, and it does not seem to maximize happiness or anything like that. Fate is simply how the world works, it's the rules that everyone plays by but that only some people can see. Although the two examples I gave are the only magical readings of fate that we actually see, and one of those is arguably magical, it should be noted that the other characters invoke the concept elsewhere. George refers to the news of his wife's death as fate before solemnly accepting, a pretty Buddhist or stoic take on the whole thing. <laughs> And Dio declares at the end of the part that if there is a god who controls fate, then he must have bound up his and Jonathan's fates the tightest. It seems as though George's righteous actions in attempting to help both Dario and Dio ultimately doomed him, and let Dio make much of Jonathan's life miserable. George does die in a strangely contented way, seemingly at peace. And that's something I'll come back to when I talk about the end of Phantom. I'm not saying the story frames good actions as muda, 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 muda. Quite the opposite, I think Phantom Blood and Jojo in general has a lot to say about the consequences of righteous behavior. But I am saying that selfless actions in Jojo are just that, selfless. Fate doesn't go out of its way to protect or reward people who are good. It is a much more mechanical, impersonal force. If fate does reward good actions, it does so by preserving those actions, by allowing the results of good actions to be passed on to family and friends. Fate hasn't rewarded Dio with anything because it approves of him. This is just how things work out. I see fate in Jojo as vaguely equivalent of the mundane rules which govern all of our lives. From the loss of physics, to the loss of one's country, to all the actions and events that happen outside of our knowledge, we all live with a myriad of restrictions that we cannot fully understand. Sometimes, when we make decisions, we have all the important information about those rules, and sometimes we do not. This conception of fate as a force of nature will be very relevant in later parts. And when I wrap up with Phantom Blood, it will be very helpful for discussing Dio's art. But for now, let's step back from all the mechanical stuff. I think that about covers it for powers. But a story is usually less about the abilities on display, and more about the people participating in and affected by the action. We talked a good bit about our main characters, and we will again. But next time, I'll cover the other characters in Phantom Blood. That one will be a fun one as characters in Jojo often reflect past ones, even before we get to the parts that explicitly remix earlier ideas. The cast of characters in Phantom Blood is the seed from which so many later characters will take form. So join me next time as I discuss, among other things, why is Poco here? Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what you saw, please leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more. My next video will be a departure from this series, but rest assured more episodes of my JoJo analysis are coming. If you want to help me make more videos in higher quality, check out my Patreon. You can get shoutouts in my videos and help vote on topics for new videos. Hi, this is Editing Luis here for a second, just to say thank you to my 
Patreon at the $5 level. Awfully fawfully. Thank you so much for your contribution. It really helped motivate me to finish this video, so thank you so much. I want to thank Laxia once again for reading quotes for this project. You can click on the card that should be on the screen to check out their review of the comic Die, a horror fantasy comic with a tabletop RPG twist on the isekai genre. I'm having a lot of fun making these videos, and I look forward to expanding beyond JoJo. Until next time, take care.